Well, thank you all for, for hanging in for a long day. This is just uh, fantastic to see so many faces out in the crowd still. Um, our topic, as you can see, is green excellence. So this is something that's been woven throughout today's discussions. But in particular, we're talking about these kinds of intersections, maximizing the intersections. And I want to thank Cynthia for putting this, this panel together. It's going to seem at first a little eclectic, but I promise you it's all going to come together with this, this theme of intersections. My name's John Erickson. I'm on the faculty here in the Rubenstein School of Environment and Natural Resources and also part of the Gund Institute for Environment. Um, my work has generally been on ecological economics, so I've spent a career at this intersection of ecology and economics. So um, it's, it's, it's a comfortable space for me to be in. Uh, we're going to talk today about this idea of green excellence, but, but maybe more accurately, a green transition and the role of various institutions and actors and players in getting us from here to there, from point A to point B and beyond. So we've assembled a, a fabulous team to explore all kinds of transitions, transitions in energy systems, food systems, technology systems, to investigate lots of intersections, all in less than 45 minutes. Um, Kurt told us that we could have all of his time, so we might, we might grab all of that as well. Um, but to investigate the intersections of markets and government, of innovation and entrepreneurship, of culture and community. So again, building on many of the themes that you've already heard about today and, and trying to knit some of these things together. So we're going to dive right in. Um, I'm going to take the liberty of introducing our panel to save on time, and then we're going to go right in with a couple of rounds of questions for warm-up and then try to have some time at the end for a few audience questions. So with us from Iceland, joining us remotely, is Thor Sigvatsen. He's the founder and chairman of Iceland Ocean Cluster, Iceland Eco Business Park, and 100% Fish. Uh, he's made a career in advancing green tech and the circular economy, things that have already come up today, at the intersection of entrepreneurship, business development, and knowledge networks. We also have with us today Torben Orla Nielsen. He's the science attaché uh, for Innovation Center Denmark. He's based in the Boston area, so thank you, thank you for coming up from Boston this morning. Um, Torben has made a career in advancing science and research partnerships at the intersection of national and regional economies and the life sciences and green tech. So two small countries represented here in our small state. So we've already got some good, good synergies here between Iceland, Denmark, and the, the state of Vermont. Um, I would argue, I, I'm an adjunct professor at the University of Iceland, so I've had been working there since 2008, and Iceland, Denmark, Vermont, we all, we heard the expression earlier this morning, we all punch above our weight. Um, and so those are some of the themes that we want to stress today around green excellence. A little closer to home, we have Heather Darby. Heather is an extension professor here at the University of Vermont. She has made a career in advancing intersections in our food system, particularly between farmers and all the parts of the supply chain, from producer to consumer and, and all of those intersection to interactions. So we're, we're thankful to have Heather with us today. And then Mass Amasaki, Associate Professor in our College of Engineering and Mathematical Sciences, again here at the University of Vermont. And Mass has made a career in advancing intersections in our energy system, including innovation and entrepreneurship and power system solutions for a renewable, more decentralized and resilient electric grid, both here in Vermont and beyond. So lots of different subject areas, but all wrapped around this theme of maximizing intersections for green excellence. So y'all ready to dive into the first question? Okay. Um, first question. You each have experience in various innovation ecosystems, a major theme of this, this summit, from fisheries and agriculture to the electric grid and green tech. So to begin, I'd like you to reflect on what are some critical ingredients, if you will, of stimulating innovation to address some of the most daunting global environmental challenges of our time. So think climate change, biodiversity loss, resource depletion. And I thought we'd start 
from the international experience of, of Torben, from an international collaboration uh, perspective and, and kind of seeding key innovation partnerships. So Torben, take it away. Thank you so much. And um, first of all, thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, I'm really glad to, to be sitting here. Uh, and before I go into your question, I just want to say that, uh, and you mentioned that already in the beginning, there are so many similarities between, uh, I would say, uh, Vermont and Denmark. I mean, we are small in size, we are surrounded by bigger players, uh, we uh, have no natural resources uh, of large extent, we, uh, we have a focus on work-life balance, uh, I think which is important also uh, for the solutions we are going to discuss here. And uh, we have uh, both, I believe, a changing economy. I mean, Denmark, we are 6 million people. We used to say we are 26 million pigs, meaning what I'm saying is that we, uh, up till 10, 20 years ago, had a large uh, agricultural sector that was driving our economy. And that is definitely changing today. Uh, pharmaceutical, medtech, and life science is the engine of Danish economy nowadays. And I just learned this morning by the president that it is the high-tech manufacturing that is now uh, also the big leader here in, uh, in Vermont. So, so these things I think we can, uh, we can take into uh, consideration uh, on, on the debate. Going to your question, um, I'm, in, I'm posted by the Danish Ministry for Higher Education and Science in, in Boston. Um, I'm one out of seven science agencies that Denmark has posted around the world in, in technology hotspots. And my job basically is to be an in-person dating app. My job is to, mm -hmm. to uh, get researchers from Denmark to, to collaborate with, in my case, people on the west coast of the US, and my epicenter is in Boston, but, but uh, I cover a lot of ground. Um, we mainly work in two areas, life science, because of the argument I mentioned before, that that's the engine of Danish economy. But the other thing which goes into your question is the green transition. And the driver here is that Denmark has set a goal of reducing our CO2 footprint by 70% by 2030. And this is not just a, a government decision. This has been made into law with the backing of 89% of the Danish parliament. So it means that it won't be changed when the next government is in place. This is a driver because this is also a way of saying that we have a burning platform. And uh, by setting a goal which is only seven years from now, the goal was set uh, three years ago, uh, and this is like almost tomorrow. So we are in a hurry to get to the 70% to the reduction goal. And the way we have done it is that we have made a green research strategy from the government and we have set aside money. We have pointed out four areas, we call them missions, uh, where we believe we need to do a special effort in order to reduce our CO2 footprint. And those are green fuels, or so power to X, carbon capture, circular economy, and the whole food area. And this is basically where we focus, and this is basically where I focus my job, uh, to find collaborators in those four areas. I don't work in all four areas. I mainly work in the, the food and egg space uh, on alternative proteins and in the area where I, I'm so happy to work with uh, Mass as well when it comes to uh, power systems, transmissions, and green fuels and, and power to X. So the message is here that that the regulation and the boundaries are actually a driver for innovation. And I think if I can take a few more minutes, this is also set up because Denmark has a, a history of doing that before. Uh, we actually did it by creating uh, a whole industry in, uh, in wind, wind turbines uh, that started roughly 20, 25 years ago. And that was also made by setting up boundaries on how we would like to generate power in, uh, in Denmark. And that has led to that roughly 30% of wind turbines globally are produced by Danish manufacturers. So regulation and boundaries can be a driver of, of innovation. <laughs> All right, as a new age economist, music to my ears, regulations drive innovation. I love it. 
Don't hear that in Washington, D.C. circles very often, but I, I like that. I like that. Um, so let, let's explore one of these intersections a little, a little further, the interse intersection between industry and research and development, which is, which is again, a big theme of this two-day summit. And I want to turn to Thor now, our, our, our guest from Iceland, who's joining us via Zoom. Thor, take it away. Well, I, I actually have a niche here. I'm not actually solving all the problems of the world, but I've, I've had taken on one mission, which is basically the waste in the seafood industry. Uh, we have now estimated at least 10 to 15 million metric tons of uh, fish, perfectly good proteins that are sustainable, natural, traceable proteins that are thrown away because of uh, wrong mindsets, because of uh, lack of knowledge. So Icelanders have basically now set sort of the, the mission to at the Iceland Ocean Cluster to work on that in collaboration with, with others. And having such a niche, sort of niche uh, emphasis, it's basically been our work now to involve uh, the seafood industry. And what's interesting with the seafood industry is that one of these industries that are kind of in the shadow. It's not that people don't see that much of a future in the industry and uh, uh, they see it as a, as a part of the past somehow. Aquaculture, of course, a little bit more close to the, to, the, to the times that we live. But the fact is we have 70 million fishermen all around the world. And this is a really important part of our protein intake. But still, the problem is, and our mission is, to figure out how to make sure that people are not leaving all these amazing proteins in their landfills. Sadly, the U.S. is not the best in the world in that. Icelanders are now up to 90% usage of each fish, while most nations are closer to 50 to 55%. This means that we're wasting a lot of perfectly good food, perfectly good protein. And what we've been doing to try to sort of tackle this issue is first just to map the opportunities and map the, the, the problem. It had not been done in, in any formal manner, we felt. So we did that and it, it created quite a, quite, a, quite a movement, I think. And then we started with our low hanging fruit, which was basically to involve academics, research institutes, investors, and the fishermen themselves with the startup community, which became a crucial part of the whole thing, to try to make a difference here. And we did this in Iceland as a prototype in the last 10 years, actually. It, uh, and it, it went on to become quite an amazing uh, uh, industry now, just, just fully utilizing the byproducts. So now some of the companies that were, were started only in 2007, 8, 9, 10, they are now some of the most important and most valuable seafood companies in Iceland, but just taking the fish skin to create skin craft for medical purpose or taking the enzymes from the intestines that have been thrown away and creating something out of that. All this has been done with what we call cross-pollination. But to do so, of course, we need to have the universities close by. And the, the thing is, in the last session, we, the, the, I heard the, the word silos. The problem is still, as I came from the academy after my PhD, I felt that we were kind of in a silo. So we need to break out of these silos. And that's been a part of our work at the Iceland Ocean Cluster to try to bring together the researchers and the industry to create value and let people understand and try to inspire them. Not only the, the industry, we need the academics, we need the research with us on that. But we've been well on our way in Iceland. My mission now is to take this globally and we're actually on our way with quite successful projects, not least in the US now with the Great Lakes. And uh, so I think that we have huge opportunities, even though I'm just taking that one niche example, but it shows that we can make a difference both on, on micro scales and macro scales, but we need the cross pollination here. Wonderful, thank you. Perfect example of ingredients of stimulating innovation at these, these cross sections and getting out of our silos. I, I, I love the, the opposite of, of maximizing an intersection is staying in our silos. So we're gonna to turn to Heather now and, 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 and Thor already set this up and talked about sort of involving fishermen, involving fisherwomen, involving producers in the innovation. And Heather has a lot of experience right here in, in Vermont in involving farmers in innovation. So Heather, take it away. All right, thank you. Um, yeah, I, you know, I've been thinking about this a lot since Cynthia 
asked me to participate. Like, what would I have to add to this conversation? And I would say, um, you know, what, like, what drives innovation is regulation on the farming community, but also adversity, lack of resources, financial distress. <laughs> like, there's, you know, usually, unfortunately, it's these adverse factors that get people to become really creative about how to solve a problem that needs to be solved with very little. So what ex excites me about working with the farming community is that they know how to solve problems with very little. And their minds go into a mode that many of us at the university just, I don't know if we've ever <laughs> Have experienced that where there's this sort of level of desperation to solve a problem without having anything. Um, and, you know, when I come in, I'm even thinking about today when we were having some issues with something, we need to get something planted. It's going to rain tomorrow. What's the thing that we're going to do to fix that um, on our own? And so that kind of innovation is hard to capture because it happens in this sort of real time mode. Uh, research doesn't always happen in real time. You know, immediately when people need that thing the most, we're kind of finding out about it and then getting ready to do the research. Um, and so working hand in hand with our stakeholders is probably one of the most critical things that I feel like, at least from my job at the university that I bring to the table is that I'm out on the ground. I'm seeing those needs. I'm seeing those um, challenges. I'm seeing the opportunity where some of us at UVM could step in and solve some pretty significant problems, both, you know, helping the environment to helping farm viability and the working landscape, and then bringing that back to my own work and my own team or the other colleagues around me. <clears throat> Just one example of that I mentioned to John when we were talking is that, you know, we're trying to eliminate neonicotinoid seed treatments in the state of Vermont and many other states too. One of the big issues is the dust that comes out of the planters that are planting that seed. That's a solvable problem, probably with not many resources. The farmers are just hearing about this, and now we're working as a team with the farmers and my extension team to come up with some kind of prototype. That should already exist. It should already exist. It should not be an issue. This is a simple thing. But the, you know, often big companies of the world may not want to do that, but I'm on the ground, I want to do that for the betterment of our state and for the farmers and the regulations that they're gonna face in a few months, years, who knows? But it's that collaboration with the people on the ground that help us put real solutions into place with their input, which also means they're excited to adopt it and put it into place. There we go, we'll just wrap up with that. Thank Beautiful. you. Beautiful, thank you, thank you so much. So, um, yeah, if we, if we think of all of these intersections along a full supply chain, um, there, there is the, the last link is to the end user, the consumer, the citizen, the person trying, trying to either change their own behavior or adopt a new technology. And, and Mass has given a lot of thought to this in the electric power sector and, and stimulating some innovation around electricity and elect electrical use and grid management with the end user in mind. So, Mass, I wonder if you could talk some about that intersection. So, so speaking of seeds and, and ingredients, and we had you know, a, a nice show on, on Sodexo earlier, I, I think when it comes to Vermont and energy, there are phenomenal ingredients available. And so we can go back to the year 2000. Uh, the, the Amer America had its first energy efficiency utility. That was Efficiency Vermont, selling negative or selling energy savings. We then had, Vermont had America's first 100% renewable utility. That was Burlington Electric which is UVM's own utility. We also have one of the top 10 energy brands in the world. This is competing with Tesla, uh, any other basically brand in the world, as Green Mountain Power. Vermont has a footprint in the energy space that punches way above its weight. 
Um, and that's what makes really, really fun, makes for a really fun environment when it comes to energy innovation. Because it, within a mile, I can drive down or I can call up, you know, Dan at Velco, Carrick at Velco, folks at GMP, folks at BED, and you can hear kind of what are the challenges of tomorrow because they're working on today, which makes it really easy for us to kind of predict what the future will look like, apropos Nils Bohr, <laughs> right? If we know what the future looks like, it's pretty easy to predict it. And so we have a really phenomenal ecosystem for kind of developing tools, methods, techniques, and technologies to solve energy problems of tomorrow. And so when it came to kind of working with industry, working as a faculty member in a university setting like UVM, it isn't perhaps in hindsight a surprise that something like packet-sized energy could work. Maybe it isn't a surprise that the ecosystem that is Vermont gives birth to something like beta, right? That's possible, maybe not because of, of a vacuum, but really because of a really rich ecosystem of existing and historical trends. And so where we are today with packet-sized energy, a lot of our focus was really on how do we encourage people to participate in kind of load coordination scheme or participating in optimizing energy consumption for the state or for a utility. And for folks to participate in that energy transition is a fairly complicated problem, right? Most of us as faculty members, we like to solve energy riddles. We like to solve hard energy problems, but for the average consumer or for the general public, they don't want to be bothered with energy problems every hour, every 15 minutes, or every day. And so what we developed was technology that was effectively autonomous or self-driving while maintaining comfort and convenience of the end consumer, while still delivering really valuable flexibility for the grid, which enables uh, renewable integration, which enables decarbonization, and which makes electrification possible at scale. And so all of these technologies that we developed at UVM with UVM undergraduates, with UVM graduate students, and those students coming from around the world and around the US was possible because of the ecosystem that we're in, because of the seeds that were planted over the last 20 years with industry presence and industry innovation. And so when the US looks for energy innovation, they have one eye towards Vermont at all times because they're looking at what's next. And so it's super exciting to be in Vermont working on these problems. And it's really fun to kind of grow and have the support of the institution of UVM in our sails and in our wings. So, you know, ingredients, I think, you know, Vermont has the ingredients to, to develop that next generation technology, next generation tools that enables the public to be part of the solution while still not harassing the public with SMSs or notifications <laughs> or whatever else it is that we, we have our phones tell us what to do. Wonderful. We're hearing a lot of small is beautiful kind of messages. I hope you're, you're catching on to this. Like our smallness is our strength. And this is another great example of that. So I'm going to take uh, moderator's prerogative and answer, ask some questions that I, I don't know the answers to. And I really want some good thoughts to this uh, for myself and my students. So in cultivating this theme of ours, green excellence, within sectors of the economy or regions of the world, there's, there's lots of these what comes first dilemmas, right? Lots of these so-called chicken and egg problems. So here's mine. Should we prioritize greening the current system, the current socioeconomic system, within current cultural, political structures and goals? Like, to what extent should we put our energy into kind of, you know, greening the system we're in? Or should we spend more effort on working towards cultivating a new system with new goals that would ultimately drive new innovation? Um, this is, we get stuck in this kind of chicken and egg problem in ecological economics all the time. So, easy question. In your experience, <laughs> how do we bring about systems change while we're working within the current system? This is something that I'm banging my head against the wall all the time. Even here at UVM, working within the current system to change the system, what does that look like? I didn't pick an order for this one. Who, who wants to take this one on first? Uh-oh. I, I can jump in, and then we can go backwards. That sounds good. Um, and so so I, I think you mentioned your chicken or the egg. And I say, fortunately, we have both, chickens <laughs> and eggs. And, and that's, I think, really important because one leads to the other. And, and when, it comes to, when it comes to 
um, learn innovation in energy. The one thing that's really important, and, and certainly as a faculty member or as a, a entrepreneur, what's really important is that you don't get stuck, right? It's important that you try something, you have a hypothesis, you test the hypothesis quickly, as quickly as you can, and then you learn from that hypothesis as quickly as you can, and you incorporate that into your next chicken and egg question. And so the iterate, iter so fail fast and iterate often is, is the strategy that we use all the time, whether it's you know, solving research problems, trying to understand the impact of potential solutions, technologies, um, or whether it's about building products, uh, working with industry, or developing DOE um, proposals. It's really about develop hypotheses, test them quickly, iterate and learn from them as quickly as you can. And so, you know, whether the chicken or egg came first <laughs> is probably not as important as, you know, how many hypotheses can you have and test and, and what Great. can you learn from them. Great. So don't stand still. I think that's the key All right. question. Another theme for today, right? Small is beautiful, but also we're going to make a lot of mistakes. And that's okay. <laughs> if we're going in reverse order, All right. Heather? Okay. Don't sit still which is absolutely what I follow every single day, sitting on this couch in the middle of the afternoon. I said, <laughs> I hope I don't fall asleep because the only time I sit down pretty much ever is about 11 o'clock at night is when I sit on my couch, except I have one of those and my feet go up. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's great, but then it's... <sighs> um, so I absolutely agree I'm constantly putting out whatever the daily fire is. Somebody called this morning and their corn's all cut off. So what do I do? You know, is it the normal thing I do? Is it some innovative thing? Like what am I gonna tell that individual who's dealing with an issue today? So I have to go with what I know and what I've learned, but also meeting the people I work with where they're at. To make a systems change, you don't just walk out onto a farm and say, I think that you should do this, even though you've been doing that for 10 generations on your farm and you're still here. So clearly you're not doing anything really wrong. So to make systems wide change, that's, a, that's time, but also still gathering that input from the people that you work with. You cannot make systems change by forcing your ideas down somebody else's throat. And I have learned that all kinds of ways in life, right? I think we've all learned that. We don't just change. That systems change has to come from building relationships, um, meeting people where they're at, really understanding why they're doing what they're doing. You know, a lot of people don't know that maybe something they're doing is hurting someone else or the environment um, until they know. And then once we know, we're making a decision about whether we continue that way or not. That's a, it's a very different place in a relationship with someone when you say, hey, look, that insecticide you're spraying or the way you till the ground is leading to eutrophication in the lake. Would you wanna be told that about something that you do every day? You're killing the environment. I'm sorry, I'm staring right at you. You're <laughs> killing the environment because you came to work today. Um, you know, so I, it's like our approach is really important and how we start to make system level change is not just, you know, s sitting um, and thinking about how we want to do it and what we think is right. So I think I'll end on that, that we have to work with the people that that we wanna change, meet them where they're at, understand why they're doing what they're doing, and then actually really think about, is our solution the right one? Because I think if I haven't heard it once, I've heard it 8,000 times, and I know um, other people in this room have heard this too. Well, UVM told me to do <laughs> this in 1950, and now UVM is telling me that today that has led to a eutrophication problem in the lake. So just because we think it's the right thing to do today, um, it may not be the actual solution. So there we go. We're going, we should move on. It's UVM's <laughs> fault. That's my answer to most things. So that's Usually good. it's the government's <laughs> fault. But <laughs> Awesome. Thank you. Uh, great lessons at these intersections. Um, so let me, let me kick it back to Thor, who's had a lot of experience 
and working within a system while trying to change the system. And he, he touched a little bit about his experience in the fishing system in, in Iceland, but now trying to move those lessons learned to the rest of the world. Thor, take it away. It's, uh, these panelists are so great. They're actually saying everything that I would like to say. But uh, just to make a point here, at least also, Iceland is small. For me, Vermont is, is big. So uh, we have a population of 380,000. So it's... Uh, for us, Vermont is even big. Of course, Denmark is huge for us. But anyway, just uh, a sideline. What I think, I, I think absolutely in line with what you're saying. I think the the system change is good. We are working with uh, mindset, trying to inspire people to make a difference. And if there is a system change, I think in a way it is. That's something that we would, I would say, is the is the crucial part. But I think also. The, uh, the uh, just examples that I have is now that, for instance, once again, I'm into fish. So regulators are telling us now in various countries that they are probably thinking about setting laws about no waste. And this is really hard for many fishermen because they've never heard of the word no waste in seafood. They've always thought of uh, waste being a normal part of the seafood industry. So we need, basically, I don't like that approach in that sense. And I've, I've seen so many examples. I was just, I visited a fisherman in, in, in the Great Lakes, around the Great Lakes. And one guy had this, you know, full can of fish skin. And, I, and, and he was just saying, this is, this is my waste, part of my waste. We said, we can do something with this here. And he became so excited about that, that once again, I'm in my minuscule world of fisheries in small towns in the Great Lakes, but still it was so incredible to see how these guys, just similar to the farmers, I guess, that have been in the stories from there, is that how inspired they get when they realize that if they cooperate, they can actually create value and, and minimize the so-called waste. So they are themselves understanding that there is no waste in this in the seafood industry, and we have I've never, I've, I don't touch upon the idea of a system change there. There is a mindset change that needs to come. That's the most important part, I think. Wonderful, thank you. So we'll uh, we'll loop back to where we started and and end, end with Torben on this question of systems change. Our other longtime senator, Senator Sanders, is always pointing to Denmark and Norway and Iceland and, and the Scandinavian countries about other ways of thinking, other ways of doing business. So if you could, you could reflect on, on sure. those kinds that, of systems That's absolutely changes. true. I mean, uh, Vermont is one of the states that are very well known in Denmark because of Senator Sanders. That's, uh, that's true uh, when he mentioned that several times during the, the previous presidential campaign. I, I would like to, uh, to celebrate or, or keep celebrating uh, the uh, smallest beautiful uh, a little bit more. Um, and emphasize the importance of interdisciplinarity and, 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 um, and the convergence of, of technology, because that is so important. Um, it took me a while to understand why Kendall Square in Cambridge and Boston, what, what is it that actually makes that place so unique? In the beginning, I've been there four years now, I still feel I only scratched the surface to understand what's going on, but. But in the beginning, I was talking a lot about how many researchers there was, how many startups, how much uh, venture capital that was raised, all that numbers, which is basically a bit boring, and people tend to forget it and don't understand what's really going on. It is, in my mind, the ability to work across disciplines that really makes Kendall Square, Cambridge, Boston, uh, the unique place in specifically life science that it is today. Uh, and you can simply, for those of you who are, who are familiar with, with Cambridge, if you are on Main Street and Aim Street, in this in intersection and simply do a 360 uh, spin, you look at first Broad Institute, then you look at MIT Koch Institute, then you look at Schwarzman, the new College of Computing, then you look at the previous headquarters of Moderna, and then you end up at Whitehead. <laughs> And what's are really unique with these five institutions and companies are their ability to work across disciplines, the ability to, uh, to manage research. And this is something everybody is talking about at celebrating at speeches, but it is really, really hard to do. Because this implies that you have to change the way of funding, the way you manage people, and the way you understand research and technology, how that in interacts. 
and going back to the small of beautiful, the, when you are in a small community, you, you are really in a position where you actually can do that. Uh, so, so, and that goes, even though Thor said something else, I think that really constitutes uh, Vermont, uh, Iceland, and Denmark. We are in a position really to do that. Beautiful, thank you. Okay, we are right at time, so now we're gonna negotiate with Kirk. Okay, we'll go for a few audience questions. So, um, if anyone would like to follow up with a question or two, we would love to hear from you. Uh, we've got a microphone coming around here. Let's, we'll stay on topic here. Green excellence and maximizing the intersections. Go ahead. Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, well, you know, in it, at the edge of knowledge and innovation, there's, there's a lot of um, old talk, as uh, Kyle Clark was mentioning earlier today. Uh, looking forward, there, there are lots of promises made, uh, the promises that may not be easy to keep. Um, and since we're talking about Vermont and Denmark and Iceland, I have a question about Vermont and Denmark, that sh where they share, we share a commitment to biomass and imported biomass for energy. Denmark imports about 40% of its biomass fuel and McNeil, Vermont's largest generating station, imports about al almost 60% of its biofuel uh, from out of state, mostly from New York. Currently, this is presumed to be zero emission fuel at the facilities. But there's a pile of evidence to the contrary. Can you comment on the risks of forward-looking promises and, uh, for example, relying on uh, biogenic uh, sources as uh, being Great. presumed zero carbon? And a view from Iceland would be really interesting because of uh, the very low amount of tree cover and on the island, thank okay. you. Thank you for that question, yeah. I mean, uh, woven throughout this conversation is the move to a low, low carbon society. And there's gonna be lots of trade-offs along the way. And it relates to my question of working within the current system as we try to move to the new. So I don't know if specifically around biologically based energy, but if you want to co comment on that promises kept theme. I can give two answers. I can give the uh, official one, which is based on, on Dane's policy, and I can give you the, my personal one, uh, because I tend to agree with you there is an issue with, uh, with biomass, uh, and this is something we are crucially aware of uh, when it comes to reaching our goal of a CO2 uh, reduction of 70% by, by 2030. Uh, so officially we haven't reached that yet, but we will, I'm pretty sure, and this is part of those four missions I mentioned before that are in, in the Danish green research strategy. I can, I can share a little bit about McNeil or, or I guess the low carbon emission from the wood burning site. And so kind of like my socks, right? My socks are kind of lying because nuclear energy is not black and white either. <laughs> and, and so when it comes to McNeil, and we talked earlier about regulation, if politicians determine that something is low emissions or no emissions, it doesn't necessarily mean it's no emissions because it really depends on where we draw our system boundary. And so if we draw our system boundary certain ways, things become more favorable than, favorable than other ways. And so kind of, you know, McNeil is a part of one generating plant. It's part of a BED system. It's part of Vermont system. Certainly part of New, New England system. And so wood burning is better than certain other sources of, of burning. Coal, for example. And so you know, there are transition fuels, and there are long-term solutions, sustainable solutions. Solar and wind are the cheapest source for generating capacity today. The future is going to be determined by solar and wind. And so hopefully, as we go towards that future, the, the need for political regulation around something like McNeil is going to be less necessary to solve 
a low, uh, or to create a low carbon economy. And so I, I, I agree with you that it's kind of silly to, to politically deem something low carbon when indeed it literally burns <laughs> carbon. The word transitions hides lots of things. Um, why don't we grab a, a second question and then we'll wrap up. Here we go. Chris Kleba, I thought you left our state. Um, Professor Emeritus. <laughs> uh, thank you for this uh, session. Um, about five, ten years ago, uh, the Vermont Council on Rural Development, BCRD, um, mounted a, uh, an extended conversation around the climate economy. And uh, some good ideas were generated out of that. Um, I'm wondering what might be done to do more strategic planning to anticipate not only the, the climate neutrality around green excellence, but also the adaption, adaptation. Um, you know, Heather, particularly, you know, changing climate conditions, what opportunities lie before us, what opportunities lie before us for adapting in northern climates to increasing warmth. Um, so I'm curious about the adaptation side, about collective planning efforts, and specific initiatives around using things like test beds and creating experimental testing grounds and identifying needed areas that we could actually uh, steer technological developments, research efforts around pressing problems that we may not be focusing on. I know that's a there's a lot on the table I just threw out, but choose one of those avenues. How's that? <laughs> All right. We, we've talked about food systems and energy systems and innovation systems. So this, again, there's this tension between mitigation and adaptation as we build the climate economy. Um, Thor, your experience in Iceland, if you want to jump in about, about moving towards a net zero economy. And certainly Iceland is making some great strides there. Do um, you want to give that, give that a whirl? In many ways, I think we, we're we just actually realizing, uh, Icelanders, that we are in the forefront in the world, of course, with our natural resources. So we have, uh, we're heating our houses with geothermal power. We're using electricity for nearly everything. We're number two in the world after Norway with electric cars. So things are moving in the right direction, but we're also spoiled. So the circular economy is kind of our problem. We're buying just as many electric uh, uh, equipment as the Norwegians and throwing it all away. So we're, we're far away from perfect. So of course it doesn't have to, uh, the fact is at least that these rich nations need to behave a little bit better. And we're, so I, I think we have an, definitely an, an issue there. We had two big challenges still, which are the, the vessels and the, the airplanes. We're so popular in Iceland that it's really difficult for us to have all these planes coming and going. It, it counts into our, into our climate issues but i i think in many ways um we are kind of spoiled so be, because of that we have been able to uh, have such cheap electricity through the years that we are actually just uh, being able to utilize that in so in so many areas and that we are kind of in the forefront but we can do better and i think um, we're not only in terms of the circular economy we can we need to move faster with the methane or our electricity on board the the, the vessels and uh, the same is with, with with some other things but uh, so I'm, I'm kind of obsessed with the circular economy as a chairman of the, the task force in Iceland and we have a long way to go there and I'm, I'm kind of saddened by the fact that it's a country that is so proud of doing more with uh, natural resources tends to be also wasting a lot of these um, uh, modern modern uh, cons consumer, things that, that we, and we need to ch tackle that definitely. Heather, do you wanna close with yeah, some thoughts? Yeah, um, as far as adapting to climate, um, we're already doing it. <laughs> At least if you're farming for a living, it happens every day because it's what you have to do. There's no way around it. When what you used to do doesn't work anymore, you find a different way to do things. So our role through the university is to help steer that really again in real time. Like um, I know things are going to progressively get warmer, but we are adapting now. And 
Um, I also farm for a living with my family and my husband, and I can tell you, since I grew up in Vermont, things have drastically changed, and we have adapted in many ways to continue to move forward. We could never grow winter barley in Vermont, and I started researching winter barley over 20 years ago. It survived one out of five years, now it survives four out of five years. So, you know, it is a new opportunity, a new potential, a new crop for farmers here. And, you know, my work at UVM, my foresight to think well, someday we could grow winter barley. Now I have all the data for the last <laughs> 20 years to really help people do it. But people are adapting in real time. And again, I think it's having those boots on the ground to really be understanding what is changing, how we can help people adapt better with the information that we have both from here and afar. And um, I'm a part of the Precision um, Sustainable Ag on-farm network, which is really focused on technology, uh, interdisciplinary program that involves about 150 farmers across the United States and extension people like myself and researchers that are implementing the same exact trial on all of those farms. We're collecting data through sensors and different technology. Um, and all of that data is being sort of moved into these models to, that help us make real-time decisions under almost any kind of environment now. And so in my mind, that's where technology has really helped myself and farmers be able to take a lot of guesswork out of how the environment is changing because we're able to collect that data from hundreds of environments now um, across the United States and spit out real-time information for farmers to use in their fingertips. And we couldn't do that even five years ago. And so now when a farmer says, should I add more nitrogen to this field um, that had a cover crop, we have that real-time data going to them. Instead of Heather Darby saying, it depends, you know, it, de <laughs> it depends if it rains today or what your soil type is. We have all of that data from hundreds of environments with decision support tools in farmers' hands. So I think that alone is really helping with the adaptation, bringing in that technology. Right. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you all to our, thank you so much to our panelists. Um, as usually, a session like this has, ends up with, at least for me, more questions than answers. But thankfully, Kirk Dombrowski has all the answers, and he's coming up to close us out for today. But please first join me in thanking our, our panelists. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Kirk, it's all you.